The filibuster, the best way to look busy while accomplishing nothing since middle school me learned you can type boobs in on a calculator. Now the easiest way to think about how the filibuster works is to imagine you're the senate secretary. Hey guys, I got Bernie Sanders on line one and he wants to propose a $15 minimum wage. Should I put him through or just stick him indefinitely on hold? If 60 of you vote to hear him out, I'll transfer the call. Okay, that's 50 votes. <clears throat> Senator Sanders, your bill is very important to us, and we'll connect you to the next available representative. Hello, Senate. Oh, new background check laws. 53 votes. I'll put you on line too. You're important also. Next representative, eh, you know the drill. Now under current Senate rules, it takes more votes to bring a bill from debate to a vote than it does to actually pass any specific bill. Specifically, it takes 60 votes to bring a bill from a debate to a vote and then only 50 votes to actually pass it from there. This strange Senate specific feature is a quirk of constantly changing Senate rules. George Washington didn't just get at his chisel and scrape this rule onto Plymouth Rock. Now, that's not to delegitimize the filibuster, I mean it's definitely very real, it's just to say that the power to change or tweak it lies solely in the hands of 50 senators saying, you know what, I think we could change and improve upon that. Now, The filibuster has changed quite a few times over the years. I could wax poetic about Aaron Burr and the filibuster back in 1805. But in my opinion, the real significant change that led to the modern filibuster rules happened in 1970. Now to go back to our Senate secretary metaphor again, before 1970, you couldn't just pit people on hold. I got a senator here who wants to pass a new voting rights law. <laughs> Should I put him through? 57 votes, alright. Uh, excuse me, the Senate is busy right now. Hey man, I gotta be honest, we have a lot of bills calling in, and I'd love it if you would just hang up so I can see if the Senate cares about the next caller. Uh, oh, you're staying on the line? Well, the Senate doesn't want to talk to you right now, so how about this weather, huh? Oh, this is gonna be a long day. Now in these situations, the Senate would just grind to a halt until debate on the current bill finished. Now this was the era of the talking filibuster, where as long as the senators just kept literally speaking about anything in a debate over a bill, well that was kinda it. You had to listen and wait until the guy passed out of exhaustion to get a yes or no vote, at which point you can move on to the next caller. Now identifying this as a problem, democratic senate majority leaders changed the rules to the system we have today. Talking filibusters have essentially been obsolete since the early 1970s, when the Senate changed its rules to permit more than one bill or matter to be pending on the floor simultaneously. Now That permitted the Senate to move on to other business while theoretical debate on the blocked item continues indefinitely. Eh, let's just stick him on hold. If we ever get 60 affirmative votes to vote on the bill, we'll take him off hold. Now, of course, that was not the end of the story. In 1974, Congress looked at the new system that the Senate had set up for itself and said, oh boy, you could really be putting a lot of important bills indefinitely on hold with this newfangled filibuster system you guys developed. If certain tax suspending and debt limit legislation call, well, you gotta put them through right away to me. No voting on whether to vote and then sticking them on hold. Now this is how Trump passed his infamous tax cut and Biden passed the recent American Rescue Plan. Also, this wasn't a tweak to the Senate rules, but rather a law that passed through all of Congress and became a law written onto the books. So unlike a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, Schumer can't just take out a red sharpie and start making notes in its margins. Now finally we come to the last major edit to the filibuster. During the Obama administration, the Republican Senate minority bloc was voting to eh, just stick every one of Obama's judicial nominees on hold. With then Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid's help, the Senate announced to its secretary, 
Hey, new rules. If a non-Supreme Court judicial appointee calls, put them straight through to us. No voting on whether or not to vote. A few years later, McConnell looked at that rule and said, well, that's unnecessarily complicated. Why are we limiting the filibuster to judicial non-Supreme Court nominees? I got an idea we can make that a little bit simpler. Now, all judicial nominees aren't subject to a filibuster. When Gorsuch calls, put him straight through to me. So those are the major changes that were made to the filibuster in modern history. Now there are two major reasons why the Senate is just slowly chipping away at this thing instead of blowing it up. Now first, it makes a great goal line defense for the minority party. Apparently, a simple majority of senators consistently doesn't have faith in a simple majority of senators making good decisions. A common misconception is that the filibuster is exclusively a Republican tool for blocking legislation. Let me tell you, this street runs two ways. Now, if you've ever heard someone pointing out how eh, Trump controlled both houses of Congress and yet he was able to get so little accomplished, well, the filibuster is why. Democratic filibusters have impeded Republican legislating, ensuring that even before Democrats took control of the House in 2018's midterms, the GOP could not pass legislation to build the wall or cut legal immigration. In fact, given how Senate seats are distributed, each state appointing two senators so South Dakota has as many senators as California does. It wouldn't be too hard to argue that empowering a Senate minority would generally lean pro-Democrat. Basically though, it's the political equivalent of driving with the e-brake on because you don't trust the car's brakes. The other issue is that the filibuster encourages bipartisan discussion. You either need buy-in from some members of the minority party to end debate and take something to a vote, or you control more than 60% of the Senate. At which point, you earn the right to ignore those people. Now, there are two distinct concerns pushing against this mentality. First, people will point out that both parties in recent years have turned into voting blocks dedicated to holding the line and preventing the other one from passing anything. So compromise just isn't happening in the way it used to. And second, people will say that watering down important pieces of legislation can make them worse for everyone. Now there are potential solutions to this problem. It's a filibuster compromise that people are noodling over with Joe Manchin as we speak. These numbers, well they're not set in stone. Maybe it takes 55 votes to transfer the call. 51? Now other people have proposed removing the phone's hold feature and going back to the talking filibuster again. I mean, we already saw Ted Cruz performatively talk filibuster the Obamacare vote by reading Green Eggs and Ham. Let's see if he has the balls to read a racist one. Now, this would see the Senate Majority Leader unable to schedule other debates while a piece of legislation is being filibustered, and the guy has to keep talking until he passes out so he can vote on the thing. Of course, that's a bit time consuming, as you can't focus on other issues. So lastly, there's a bit of a related compromise suggestion. Require all 41 senators blocking a bill to be present on the floor at all times, rather than just require one of them to be constantly talking. This would mean that rather than needing 60 votes to move forward on debating a bill to voting on it, you would need 41 votes constantly present to keep the debate going. Now in this case, the secretary's question would be like, hold on a sec. Who doesn't want to take this call? If 41 or more hands aren't raised when we ask that question, sorry, but you're going to have to take this vote. Ooh, Ted Cruz just went to the bathroom? Quick, let me get Senator Sanders off a hold. <clears throat> oh, who in the Senate doesn't want to vote on whether or not to have a $15 minimum wage? Okay, only 40 votes now. Time to actually take this thing to a vote. So that's a top to bottom analysis of the filibuster. Past, present, and maybe future. I hope I clarified some of the nuances to this odd senate blocking tool. Until next time, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons here for helping me put out my videos. 
If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.